Buenas noches, mi gente. What a beautiful group of people uh, for this event. Wow. You all look so cute in the little Zoom Mundo boxes. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Bienvenidos uh, to City Lights Live. This is the virtual event series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendars during this uh, pinche pandemico. Uh, the bookstore is continuing to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums into the spring season and beyond happening right here in the Zoom Mundo. So uh, we're really grateful that you've uh, made the transition with us and are here. We know it's not like having the events at the bookstore like we've been doing for decades, but you know the, the Zoom Mundo will do for now. Um, before we start, I'd like to remind everybody that City Lights is uh, the actual bookstore. You know, the bookstore is actually open for business. It's been open for a couple months now. Um, we're open seven days a week from noon to 8 p.m. And we're following strict uh, SF Health Department guidelines to keep your visits safe. So, uh, you know, if you're around in the neighborhood of North Beach and uh, you want to come visit us, please do. Because the bookstore, honestly, mi gente, it misses y'all. It really does. So come on back. And uh, yeah, come, come visit us. Uh, um, uh, yeah, we'll be waiting. <laughs> but in the meantime, tonight, we are beyond thrilled. This gato is beyond thrilled to feature an awesome and important new novel uh, from Patricia Engel. It's called uh, Infinite Country. And it's published by Simon & Schuster. It follows the lives of Colombian familia fractured by deportation and offers an intimate perspective on an experience that so many have endured and so many are going through once again. The timing of this book could not be better, mi gente. Um, let me do some quick introductions. And uh, I'm really excited about the, 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 the authors that we have uh, tonight with uh, Patricia. I'm gonna be in conversation and commenting on some of her parts of the book. So um, quick bios. Patricia Angel is the author of The Veins of the Ocean, winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, It's Not Love, It's Just Paris, winner of the International Latino Book Award, and Vida, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway and Young Lions Fiction Awards, New York Times Notable Book, and winner of Colombia's National Book Award, the Primero Biblioteca de Narrativa Colombiana. She is a recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and National Endowment for the Arts. Patricia's stories have appeared in the Best American Short Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. Patricia teaches creative writing at the University of Miami. So y'all give it up for Patricia and the book launch tonight of Infinite Country. Um, yes, yes, yes. Make some uh, jazz hands for Patricia and her book. Um, tonight, uh, Patricia is going to be joined by an all-star cast of amazing writers and activists. And they're not just paying me to say that. It's true. Let me start off first by introducing Roberto Lovato. He's a journalist and member of the Writers Grotto. He is one of the country's leading writers and thinkers on Central American gangs, refugees, violence, and other issues. Lovato is also a co-founder of Dignidad Literaria, the national movement formed to combat the invisibility and silencing of Latinx stories and books in the US publishing industry. He's also a recipient of a reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center and a former fellow at UC Berkeley's Latinx Research Center. His essays and reportings have appeared in numerous publications, including Guernica, the Boston Globe, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, the Los Angeles Times, La Opinion, and other national and international publications. His most recent book is Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas, published by HarperCollins. He lives in San Pancho Califas, uh, also joining us tonight is Jean Guerrero, is an investigative journalist, author, and former foreign, foreign correspondent. Uh, Jean is the author of Crux, a cross-border memoir released in 2018 by One World. She's the winner of the Penn Fusion Emerging Writers Prize. Ms. Guerrero is the recipient of, the, of an Emmy Award for the KPBS series, America's Wall. She's a contributor to the New York Times, as well as NPR, PBS and other public media and her writing is featured in Best American Essays 2019. She's the author of the book, Hate Mongers, Stephen Miller, Donald Trump and the White Nationalist Agenda. Guerrero lives in La Mesa, California. And also joining us, and I normally have their book here but I've given it away so many times it's not here. 
pretend that this amazing book is in front of me when I'm doing this introduction, okay? Julia Delgado Lopera is an award-winning Colombian writer, historian, speaker, and storyteller based in San Francisco. They are the author of the New York Times acclaimed novel, Fiebre Tropical. I got the book right here, pretend, pretend. On March 2020, released from the feminist press. Julie is also the author of uh, Quereme, uh, which was released by Nomadic Press in 2017, and Cuentamelo, which was released by the amazing Aunt Lute in 2017, an illustrated bilingual collection of oral histories by LGBT Latinx Immigrantes, which won a 2018 Lambada Literary Award and a 2018 Independent Publishers Book Award. Julie's received awarded fellowships and residencies from Hedgebrook, Headland Center for the Arts, Brush Creek, Foundation of the Arts, the Lamdara Literary Foundation, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and the SF Grotto. Their work has been nominated for a Pushkar Prize and has appeared in Teen Vogue, the Keynet Review, McSweeney's The Rumpus, The White Review, Four Way Review Broadly, Time Out Mag, to name just a few. They are the former executive director of Radar Productions, a queer literary nonprofit located here in San Francisco. So I'll give it up for these amazing writers that are gonna be joining Patricia in conversation. Um, we're gonna be posting the links to uh, all these writers' works in the comments, the questions, if you want. If you haven't bought their books, buy their books. It's a great way to support the bookstore and a great way to support the authors. So um, without further ado, y'all, please give a warm Zoom Mundo welcome for Patricia Engel reading from a new book, Infinite Country. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I am so excited to be here with these other writers. I'm going to read a little bit from Infinite Country, but I don't want to read too long because I'm dying to get into the conversation with each of these brilliant, brilliant artists. So um, I thought that I would read something that I don't usually read um, uh, from Infinite Country. It just came out two weeks ago, so I'm still starting, still getting to know the book, you know, in terms of how I read it and share it with people. But since um, our works are really speaking towards um, the idea of migration in very different ways, I thought that I would read a scene from the novel, which is about a specific moment. So um, just to tell you a little bit, as Josiah mentioned, Infinite Country is the story of a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation, and it follows them over a period of about 20 or so years, beginning in the late 1990s and um, leading up to almost about 2018. And it follows each of the five family members, the two parents, Elena and Mauro, and their three children, and how that collective experience of being a family and the process of migrating are, are experiencing one, uh, the condition of immigration as a family, but they're also each having very private experiences that they don't always share with one another. So I'm going to read to you from a moment when Elena and Mauro, who have arrived to Houston, Texas with their baby Karina, are confronting the moment that their tourist visas are about to expire. And they either have to return to Colombia or make the decision to overstay. Um, so I'll read to you about that. In Houston, Mauda worked with many men who'd navigated the southern borderlands by foot, some four or five times. They came from different nations, passing through the corridor of the Americas, sometimes intercepted and sent back to their countries within days, while others were held for months in camps with no walls, only tarps shielding them from the prickly southwestern sun and frigid night. Still they returned, even as the journey became harder, the hazards more vicious, convinced this land offered more than theirs had already taken from them. Mauro and Elena arrived under different circumstances, but Mauro knew the consequences were the same if they didn't leave when their visas expired. Without an adjustment or amnesty, a deportation order would come. As Elena and the baby slept, Mauro held his family's three passports, running fingers, over the dates printed on each visa. Karina's baby photo pressed onto the page. They had taken it in a shop near the house in Chapinero. The store owner droned that she was too tiny to go on a plane and it was unnatural to make an Andean child cross the sea so soon. He warned she'd acquire an incurable vertigo from breaching their altitude so early in life that would haunt her no matter where she went. 
Later, Mauro and Elena laughed about the shopkeeper's insistence, but he wondered about the baby who was coming. Elena was sure it would be a boy. Mauro didn't know if she said so because she thought it was what he wanted or needed to hear, as if every man felt the primal urge to father a son. He thought of his own father, who was no example to follow. Mauro worried he wouldn't have anything to teach a son about how to be a man, but at least he could give him a life in a new land rather than tow him back to their pasts, even if it would cost them in ways they could not yet imagine. At gatherings in the homes of Mauro's co-workers, when the men passed around beers or tequila, or when talking to people from the neighborhood, no matter their nation of origin, when asked why they came to this country and stayed, they all said the same thing, more opportunity for themselves, for their children, for their queridos back home, whom they were able to support with money earned in the United States. It became true for Elena and Mauro too. What they earned in one week in Texas was more than what Mauro and Elena made in a month working at the market and her mother's laundry combined. Mauro had no education and Elena didn't attend university because she was expecting Karina. With a devalued currency, theirs was a country where it felt impossible to get ahead if one wasn't born to a certain class, rich or corrupt or talented and beautiful enough for football or farandula. If Mauro and Elena ignored the exit date stamped on their passports, the option of returning to the United States would be closed for at least five or 10 years, at which point they might be able to apply for re-entry. That they'd received visas in the first place without American sponsors and with a quota on Colombians admitted to the country each year had felt like the intervention of saints. If they stayed, they'd be limited to their existence in North America until it came to its inevitable conclusion, unless one won the green card lottery, but they were too scared to apply to take the chance. Political asylum was just as elusive. Coming from a place that gringos regularly stereotyped as a death trap didn't mean they could prove that they were unsafe without a documented history of threats. The perils of poverty didn't count, only a demonstrated danger of physical harm. Since they'd never received letters vowing to kill or dismember their families, they weren't deemed worthy of government protection. A good attorney might have been able to argue that even if one was not important enough to be a murder target, it did not mean that a person couldn't be killed at any second. But they didn't know how to find a trustworthy lawyer, having been warned about con artists who preyed on people like them, self-proclaimed miracle workers promising citizenship in a year who charged upfront, then vanished. There also existed the possibility of Elena and Mauro seeking citizenship by each marrying other people, since they weren't already married to each other. The woman upstairs whose children Elena babysat had married a white Texan for this purpose. They only saw each other for appointments at the immigration office. She'd had to pay a few thousand already and the rest was due in installments, but she never had to have sex with him and already had a green card in hand. The way she described it, marrying someone else as just a matter of paperwork didn't seem unreasonable to Elena, but Mauro refused to consider it. They were careful, scared even to play the radio too loud, not wanting to give anyone a reason to complain. They'd been told immigration officers only arrested people when tipped off. SWAT teams raiding apartment buildings, restaurant kitchens or factories, bulletproofed and body armored officers with no knock warrants, storming homes, breaking down doors if needed, as if the people inside were planning a bombing or a coup. They might take you away, or if you were lucky, let you go with just a warning, but you'd be entered in their database, called for annual check-ins and classified as deportable. Mauro and Elena could always go home. Their old lives would wait for them, yet staying under such conditions would prevent them from ever being able to visit Berla without losing the life they were beginning to make in the North. If they remained without adjusted status, they'd need to dissolve into the population, praying the laws changed for amnesty or asylum. Mauro passed time spinning bottles, flipping coins, pulling cards from a deck, searching for signs, a way to make a decision for his family to stay or to go. But there was no card for keeping Elena and her mother apart, no card for a life sentence of uncertainty, no card for forfeiting one country to bet on another, 
no card for regret. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Patricia, your book is like the first fiction book that I've read in a very long time that has reminded me of like why fiction was my first love and like how fiction can often contain truths that are deeper than can be contained in a news story or a lot of the nonfiction that I read about the immigration issue. So thank you for writing it. Oh, thank you, Jean. Uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours, so that's a huge, huge compliment. Um, I was thinking, so yeah, I love your book also. Um, and I was taking notes as you were talking. Um, one of the things that I, it was coming up for me as you were, as you were reading was like the process of like the visa process and the documentation process for immigration that happens and how little space that has taken at least in a lot of like the fiction that I've written or generally in like even immigration conversations, right? Like people in this country who are born here don't understand the processes of immigration. Like they don't understand all the levels of stuff that people are required. And I think that it was such a beautiful way in which you managed to like wound in all of these processes into the story itself and how it's kind of like landing on their body, kind of landing on how they feel and the affect, right? Like the amount of mental space that it takes for you to consider asylum or we're staying in a visa or all of this. I remember clearly when I first came here, how literate I became on knowing all these things, you know, mm -hmm. as like a teenager. I was like, oh, like I knew and I remember like then when I moved to California asking people and telling them how things work and nobody understands how actually those processes work and so I'm just like you know I'm like sitting with this and I'm just grateful for the ways in which all of these things are kind of like taking up all this space in the novel because they take up so much mental and psychic space in like immigrants minds right like it's like such a big huge part and yet like it's overseen so much um and so I really, I just, I really love that part. And the green card lottery, we're all always wanting the green card lottery. I've never met anybody who's won it, sadly. I know, I know. But yeah, Huli, thank you so much. Um, you're so right. Some, I feel like uh, so many people think of immigration just like this one step process. It just like happens and then, you know, you're in. And really, it's it's a matter of so many small decisions in many cases. A lot of people don't ever go to a new country thinking that they're an immigrant or they're going to be. They just get there and then maybe they decide to stay and just stay a little longer. And next thing you know, you turn around and years have passed, you know, and wow, you woke, you wake up and you're an immigrant, you know. I want to um, first uh, congratulate you on uh, rendering this uh kind of cross-border narrative, really difficult to do. I try to do it in nonfiction between El Salvador and San Francisco. So I was reading it, your book from the perspective of, okay, how does she do this where you have to cross, you're crossing time and space per constantly and how do you keep the reader's attention? So, I mean, one of the things you did really beautifully was um, short chapters. <laughs> Because if you have a big like piece of filet mignon beef of writing, it's gonna get stuck in your in your reader's gut, right? They're gonna get stuck, especially if you're talking about heavy stuff. So I was reading it, and you really did a, a great job in that. And I, I wrote down a phrase that I don't know. I just came up with it just now. Like the for me, I don't really want to categorize it as a immigration story. I know our search engine optimization. Uh, ruled world and the algorithms on Amazon and everywhere else demand that we put ourselves in these boxes. But I also think uh, your book, I, I read your book and, 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 I, and I came up with this phrase, it's about the beauty and the burden of the bilingual mind and the bi bicameral heart, the heart that's got a chamber in the South and a chamber in the north, and that has this artificial border put up between it that then forces us to perform and in ways. And I think that performance is part of our, I don't even think it's just it's an immigration problem. I think that's the 
problem for people labeled Latinx, Latino, Latina, right? Because we are othered, even if we're born here, we're not, I mean, just look at the way that, like, I mean, I, I'll just say it, this word BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C. I remember the back in the day, black folks didn't like being called black. I mean, uh, P-O-C. And now there, there's a term that's black indigenous and everybody else P-O-C, right? So it's an othering that, I don't know, we, we, we have, that are connected to the continent, the continent of life that Jose Marti talked about, I think have the burden and the beauty of being kind of you know, having these cross-border narratives that are part of our lives because we're the ones who are directly related to the continent. Yeah, I think that's something that I've, I've you know, Infinite Country is my fourth book and I th all my books have explored immigration diaspora in different ways. You know, that's uh, my world and my community, but I think, um, with Infinite Country and just in my own life, I've started thinking beyond it, what we've sort of always been told it means to come from a, a family that's either in the process of immigrating or, um, you know, it has in the recent past, where there it's, it's so full of binaries, we're either this or that, right, or we're hyphenated, and so we're a little bit of both, but it's, our thinking has been so limited about it, whereas there's, there's, um, there really, there's really no need for that, especially in a world where transnationalism and globalization is just part of everyday life. And our, it, we're constantly refueling our connections to our homelands in different ways and bringing it with us. I think that's what you, uh, Roberto, you, you mentioned about like this, you know, the structure, how it's going back and forth. But I think I was trying to replicate some of that real human experience you know, who somebody who has who has left a place naturally carries it with them, and your past does not get left behind. Actually, sometimes it becomes even more vividly a part of your present, with you know distance and and longing and nostalgia. Mm. Well, if nobody else says that, I agree. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the other thing I like in the book is uh, you, and I, I'm not, you, you take apart the criminal crime, you know, because these people in, in the legal sense of the law, some of them are quote unquote criminals, right? So like I, I myself was a criminal, quote unquote, back in the day, but I had to kind of come out about my things that I did as a kid in my book and things that some of my family members did. And it's, uh, I think it's really good to do that, to kind of deconstruct the, the, the construction of criminality and who's a criminal and who's not. I'm not even just talking about immigration. I'm talking about like, you know, um, how do you say, by the way, are you saying it ta, 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 Talia, like Talia Shire? Who's the yeah, character? She's, or Talia? she's named, no, she's named for the actress. So she's so named for the actress, it Talia, Talia Shire. Right? Yeah, it's Talia Shire, like, like the, act the actress, yeah. Yeah, no, see, I associate her more with The Godfather. It's interesting that Columbia puts a whole Rocky frame on her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I was thinking a lot about the in-betweenness, and I think that um, part of the reason why I was so... Um, I was so attracted to the novel was the back and forth precisely because I think that even like in the present as an immigrant, you're constantly even just going, your consciousness is just going back so much. And so just like seeing like Talia, like being in Bogota, being in Barichara, being in the road and then coming back here. And in a way as a reader, you're having that experience of like what immigrants experience mostly every day, which is like, we're constantly going back, right? We're constantly mm -hmm. going back emotionally and our consciousness is like, it lives in part over there and then it comes here. And so in a way, it's really, you're kind of replicating that experience of like mm -hmm. inhabiting that, like, it's not even a duality because it, again, it's not a binary. It's like, there's all these different layers of it. And yet like every time we fall into the scene, like the, the weight of all that past is kind of like laid on, right? And the other beautiful thing that you do is like you bring in all this kind of like indigenous mythology into it. And so it's like further expand and, and it kind of like creates this like 
additional framework in, in, through which we're, we're, we're looking at it. I hadn't read a novel um, about Colombia that talks so much about like mythology. I actually didn't know a lot of it. And it was just like so beautiful to read um, and to read part of the topography and the geography and how it's just like, just like differently connected. It was like such a, a beautiful experience. Um, but what it also reminded me was just kind of like how all of these things are laid on top of one another, right? Like all this history and you managed to do that, I think with like bringing in the myth and like, you know, all this other stuff around the violence that is kind of like in the circumference and it's kind of like putting all this pressure on the present. On the present. Um, but it is like, we're constantly in this kind of like weird duality space. And I just felt very much like, I think that that was what was so attractive. It was like, I was always here and there. I was constantly here and there. There wasn't like this one rooted place where we were at. And that is so much the experience of being an immigrant. Like, like you really, you're really uprooted. Um, you're definitely uprooted and your, and your heart and your consciousness and your psyche is just like constantly traversing all of the different spaces, not only geographical, but kind of like psychic and emotional, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think you say something so important there that it, it is people think it's, it's just a displacement, which is part of it, right? But there is so much of a, a spiritual and soulful and psychological dislocation that is part of that, that very often never gets resolved you know, and it's just something that people learn to live with. Um, and somehow that also gets passed on to the next generation, which was certainly my case, my family. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, is that something that you tapped into to like write the, the novel? Um, yeah, you know, um, I think in my earlier books, I was more interested in like the individual's experience. And of course, when you're younger, it's really kind of like all about you, you know, <laughs> um, and how does this affect me? And then with Infinite Country, I wanted to move out and I wanted to really look at the, the collective experience of a family and how each person's experience is so intimately connected to everyone else's, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you need to explain each person's experience in order to understand one of their experiences truly. But um, also that connection that you talked about, Huli, like to the land has become something that I've become much more interested in as I've gotten older. Because of course, you're from Bogota, right? You know, Bogota is a city on top of, you know, uh, ancestral land of the Muisca. And that very thing that we now consider like the both as my mother's hometown too, is actually the product of migration too. And it's just sort of this never ending thing. And which is a, a natural process. It's the natural journey of hum the human species is to migrate. And so much of that is evident in those ancestral stories. That's what, it, so we've been, we, those are the stories, the oldest stories that we have because that's our, the true nature of the, of the human animal is to move, to look for more resources, to, you know, to, to in order to, to survive and take care of its young. I mean, this is, this is the only way. And so is it, is it any wonder that, that this is still what we do today. And that's why I think what, what Roberta was talking about, the criminalization of it is so absurd in so many ways. You're, you're criminalizing something that is a natural human instinct. Yeah, yeah. And it's so much more evident when you're kind of like juxtaposing it with like the mythology part, right? Like I think that that was such yeah. a place of like respite for me and like beauty. And then you have this like stark difference with the way that like, I mean, we're still animals, right? Like we're animals and this is the way that we're being treated. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and in addition to, the, to it being sort of this antidote to the demonization, like the interconnectedness that you were talking about before, I feel like narratives like yours are so important right now because like when you show this interconnectedness between people between um people and thing things people in the land people and other people it's like like a rebellion against this ideology of isolation that has really taken root in the united states right now and which is so harmful this this ideology of um sort of like embodied by the western cowboy that is an, that is idolized by so many of you know, the, the Trumpian right-wing uh, 
you know, followers and leaders like Stephen Miller, who I write about in my book. Oh. Um, and yeah, and I just feel, I felt like your book was like exactly what we need to be reading right now for the, for, because of the way that you show that, that important interconnectedness, but also um, like the way that you render the complexity of these characters, like you do not shy away from complicated characters, um, but they're, they're real, like they are, they remind me of people that I know, people in my family, like I don't, I can't remember a time that I've read a, a fiction novel uh, about immigration that had characters that were so familiar to me and so relatable to me. Um, but the complexity is, is one of the most important parts of that, I think, and, and one of the biggest accomplishments of your, your book, um, like not shying away from the darkness in people, because right now there are so many people in power um, even, I mean, even though obviously like Trump was, was taken out of the White House, you still have people like Stephen Miller advising him and, um, you know, putting out really demonizing messaging where they try to conflate all Latinos and all, all immigrants with criminals and constantly hide it, highlighting the same cases over and over again of, of violence committed against, you know, a handful of people trying to paint immigrants as people who are committing crimes and killing thousands of Americans every year, contrary to all of the data. And so I just, just given the context that we're in, like this book is just so, so important. Well, thank you, Gina. And your book in, um, in Hate Monger, the, the way that you paint how somebody like Stephen Miller came to be, right? With just the repetition of the stories that were told to him, right? And it's, of course, it's another side to it, but it also shows how stories, even if it's like ones that are, you know, categorized as mythic or just our own histories, just the repetition of things that we are told about ourselves mm -hmm. um, is how we come to know ourselves that's how the individual determines who they are, how families determine who they are, how communities, how populations, and how countries determine who they are. And in the United States, we're also kind of like in a battle of stories, in a battle of narratives. And that's what I, and I wanted to ask you about that actually that battle of stories about countries. Like, um, I, you can, I can see in the parts in the US, they, you see the US government's hand in its policies and its effects but I didn't see it in the Colombia part. And I wanted to ask you that because you know, I spent a little bit of time in Colombia with the Cancuamo peoples over near Valle du Par, mm -hmm. which, you know, and I came to it with the imaginary of my Salvadoreño experience with the guerrillas and the, the moral topography and the political topography of Colombia are very different from El Salvador in the eighties when I'm writing about it, in the nineties. It's a lot more complex for different reasons. Um, but one of the kind of uh, almost universals across the Americas is the role of the U.S. in supporting mass murder and military dictatorships and mass murders like Alvaro Uribe's Vela, right? I mean, who, you know, is probably the bloodiest president in Latin American modern history right now, if you, in the body counts. And so I wonder, like, why, why not put the put the US, the shadow of the US in that Colombian part of the story. Well, maybe in another book, <laughs> that, that's not what I was trying to do in this book. I, um, it, this was very much focused on the family. You know, uh, The reason why you get into the whole legal aspects of uh, the United States is very much part of the process that they're in, you know, living in, in real time. Um, I think the, the the long shadow cast by the violence, the half century of violence in Colombia is pretty evident in where they are, which is in Bogota. A lot of the, the activity, as you mentioned, was far from, Bo from Bogota, although of course there were things felt and experienced there. Mm. But there are two teenagers who meet and fall in love and, and they're just going about their lives. And of course, as a result of, of, of the state of the country at that time, opportunity is limited for them and there's economic inst instability and all sorts of, um, you know, the long tail of so much uh, um, civil conflict. 
is what they're experiencing in their lives. But really, that's where their story begins. They are children of that era. You know, that's part of their of their childhood. And then, you know, they they depart from there. But also, I mean, before we we, you know, we gathered here, um, Juliana was mentioning, you know, um, about what works that she sees, you know, written in Colombia. And there's a lot written about that in Colombia already, you know, getting into all the politics, the violence, the corruption, all those things, and people who could write that far, far better than I could, you know, and I was more concerned with the specificity of this family and their journey and their, their, you know, how they're just trying to remain a family, despite the uncertainty and the distance and the separation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to touch a little bit on, um, uh, Jean was talking about a little bit about the complexities of migrating. And one of the things that I loved was kind of like that intimacy with like the pain of migration that we're having in the book you know like I and, and I think that that's also like um it just it just opened up the story about being an immigrant and about migrating and, and by intimacy I mean like you know all these moments where they're questioning what's going on where they're questioning where they're going back where they're just like you know when they're like well what are we doing here we're not even enjoying this country and like what's going on and so like, I do think that I, I, I love that, like, this kind of intimacy and, like, you know, the mom, like, cleaned the floors and then, like, and, and the, the grandmother in Bogota was, like, such a beautiful, beautiful character. And it's just such a relief. Um, I love grandmothers in general, but, like, her house and all of this. And there's, like, just this precious intimacy and, like, this precious moments of just, like, like, stillness and, like, when we slow down and we really get to see experience like the pain um, and all the questions that are coming up and how there's never an easy answer right like at the end of the day it's like there's not an easy answer there's just a decision that is made with whatever resources are available to people um, and I just like I love that I love that we get to just like really witness this intimacy in like such a close way um, and that all those questions about I mean I just and again like I'm just remembering from my own story just like for the first three years that I was here I was begging to go back I was like I just want to get out of here we also overstayed a visa and so like I had to wait for all these processes to like be put in place um, and so like but like that intimacy with that pain that you're constantly kind of like questioning while around you everything is so um, disorienting and different um, so I just I, I love like kind of like how the intimacy is being brought up um both for I think like Talia and um in in for, for the especially for the mom I think um it's just like it's, it's such a beautiful it's such a beautiful moment and like and like the dad is just like such a like sweet man <laughs> I'm like who's this sweet man he's just such a sweet man I just love that he's like such a non-threatening masculine man <laughs> I'm like oh this is like I, I think he's just like really sweet right like he's not like the typical like macho colombiano you know that it's like there I mean a little bit with the drinking maybe but like he's like such a sweet like when Talia gets there with like this boy and he just doesn't hit him I was like really you're not gonna like slap this man um I love that I just like there's all this like really beautiful moments that um I just I, I like him a lot because I think he's like a sweet a sweet man um, but anyway, yeah, the intimacy to me was like, it really, it really, it really like took a lot of space and her relationship with her dad was also like unusual in a way, right? It's usually like daughters with their mothers. And so like, I really love like that kind of like being blown up and the tenderness between them and like all this, like he goes and he waits for her, right? Just to see her when he's like, he's like staying in the street, right? He's like homeless. And he's there every single day. And that, that intimacy that we get to just experience of him, that pain, um, it 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 just it just brought it it just brought such a much like complexity and nuance to to both all of their experiences. Thank you, thank you for that, Uli. <laughs> Means a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit? This is kind of selfish, um, but can you talk a little bit about uh, like your process, like if you mm -hmm. for like if you created like um, an outline or if the, if the narrative just kind of de develops as you, as you write, how, cause it's just, it's such a like mm. tightly written 
coherent story that goes in so many different directions and like how do you hold all that together um and i'm wondering how how you how you did that um that's a good question basically i have a lot of notebooks that look like this <laughs> um this is one of many 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 um and um i just sort of i'm not like sophisticated enough to do an outline I remember they taught us how to do that in like seventh grade and I couldn't do it. Um, so my outlines are just like notes. They're just like sketches. And sometimes it'll be um, like a piece of a scene or just an image or just a, a phrase or a word, you know? And it's just kind of like clues that I make for myself. And I do that for a good long time before I even sit down to write anything because you know, I've been writing a long time. I've had the experience many times already of writing myself into a wall when I don't yet have an internal grip on the story. You know, um, It's so easy, as you all know, to lose connections to your material. You know? Or it's, you know, you're writing 50, 100 pages and then all the existential questions happen, like, why am I writing this? Will anyone care? Do I care? Is this boring? You know, and basically your mind will just do everything it can to talk you out of this because writing is hard, you know. So what I have learned to do to um, kind of protect myself in those vulnerable moments of writing is make a lot of notes, but they're just like dream notes. They're just like, and then I, and then my favorite thing are, are these things. This is my only organization are these like sticky things, you know, and I just sort of like label my, my notes um, sections. Um, so the first, by, since I was rigorously taking notes for years while working on other things before I wrote a page of Infinite Country, the first draft when I finally sat down to write it came very quickly for me. I wrote the first draft in about four months and it was much longer, much, much longer. And, um, and then it was just like, you know, a, a year of shaping it and sculpting and chiseling and cutting and cutting and cutting and, and trying to see the story for its essence. Um, and I don't know, it sounds a little loopy, but really just like letting the book talk to me and tell me what it wants to be. And I understood the book wants to be short. The book wants to be lean. The book wants to be urgent. It wants to not waste time, you know? Um, and then I, as you know, the, the writer have to have to facilitate that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So I don't are are there any questions like from the from the, the peoples? There aren't any in the chat. We usually have to go people uh, questioning you, but it'll happen. All right, well, now but, would be the time, right? Yeah. People in the Zoom is, window, here's your chance to ask questions of any of these wonderful authors tonight. So don't leave but, the event with a question on your mind. This is your chance. But as a fan of all these writers who are, you know, kind enough to, to join me this evening, um, I started um, asking this before we um, turned the conversation public, but I would love to hear more about what their current projects are, you know, what their latest obsessions are with their own work, um, and if they, they could share some of that. So I'm going to throw it to to um, Roberto. <laughs> okay, I'm working on my next book, which is tentatively titled, titled Letters to a Young Poet Warrior, following uh, a little bit of what Rilke was trying to do in terms of aesthetics and poetics, but for written for a moment of uh, epic crisis, like the one we're in. I mean, or, you know, Rilke is a World War I veteran, so he's no stranger to uh, crisis, but there's nothing the world's ever faced like what we're dealing with. And I have a belief that a lot of what we call literature in the world, in the United States, let me just say the United States, some parts of the South have really written some things, but in the United States, literature has largely failed us to, to prepare us for this epic moment we're in, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, I'm writing kind of, at least what I learned from 30 years of, you know, warfare and genocide and a lot of things I'd like to forget, but can't. Um, and then understand what the 
um, what the political and poetic implications are exactly, you know, kind of throwing out whatever I know of, whatever Jedi knowledge I bring from my experience of the things that I've seen and, 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 and help in the hopes that it would help people navigate um, this crisis ridden world a little better. Yeah, I love that. I'll be looking for that one. Uh, how about you, Huli? Um, I have two projects right now going on. So one of them is a novel. One of them is a series of essays. The novel is, um, as of now, titled Papi, and it's about a papi. And Papi lives in Colombia. So it all happens in Colombia, and Papi's a closeted fag. And mom dies, and he, um, and we kind of like, started revealing old daddy secrets and he we see a lot of the underground queer scene of 70s 80s and 90s Bogota and so I'm, I'm in that and then the series of essays is titled Tudo Dollar Churro which is the way the women in the mission pronounce Tudo Dollar Churro um, and it's just a series of essays around Spanglish. Is that for a book, Holy the essays? Well, supposedly, we'll see what happens with those. Those are just, I, it's, it's a little different because those are like, you know, I'm writing and I'm publishing them and like, we'll see what happens at the end, but hopefully they, they'll come into book. Yeah. Amazing. Jane. Um, so I'm working on a couple of breaking news things that I can't go into right now just because I'm on deadline, but I'm also, just very focused on promoting, still on promoting hate monger and finding new ways to bring that information to people. Cause I feel like a lot of people are breathing a, a much deserved uh, sigh of relief uh, after Trump left office, but Stephen Miller continues to be a very important and powerful figure. Um, he's probably one of the closest people to Trump still and helping him prepare his ongoing attacks on reality. And um, so we're working with um, a producer and a screenwriter and we're trying to, we're, we're approaching studios right now to try to sell the film rights. And I'm really excited about the screenwriter and his vision because um, it was very important to me to not like glorify uh, and this anti-hero because like our culture already has this fetish for the white male anti-hero um, and I feel like it's really easy to fall into that trap like a lot of the writers about Steve Bannon and the filmmakers about Steve Bannon sort of made him into like this mastermind um, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to make sure that we, that we don't do that I mean I tried to make sure I didn't do that with with the book just showing like how he very much is a case study in radicalization like he's not coming up with these ideas he's just very good at parroting things that were that he was indoctrinated with as a teenager during a vulnerable time in his life and um just during a time when so many people in the united states are being radicalized by white supremacist ideas and, and far-right extremism i feel like it's just like a really important case study in how that happens and like how that affects people yeah Absolutely. Well, Patricia, we do have a couple of questions from, from the Zoom audience. That's all right. So, so Wendy uh, asks, uh, she says she's a Latina immigrante who grew up uh, in this uh, America, KKK. I got all your books. Thank you all for your words. I've been steeped in African-American scholarship, which has ignited my own questions about my place and historical legacy. I don't have a circle that would feed what I need other than Gloria Anzaldúa, might any of you share any places that I should look? Yeah. Assuming that goes to anybody that wants to answer. <laughs> okay. Um, geez. Let me think. I mean, there, there are so many people writing great stuff now. Um, um, I was going to say, if, if that's what you're reading so far, if you haven't read um, Daisy Hernandez's um, A Cup of Water Under My Bed, um, is really brilliant stuff. Um, everything by um, Carolina de, Ro de Robertis, and of course by all these writers up on the screen, I'm excluding myself, uh, Jean and Juli and Roberto. Um, and 
you all please jump in because what I, something weird happens to me whenever I'm asked for recommendations and my brain just like takes a vacation. So um, what do you all think? I mean, I'm thinking uh, Elena Maria Viramonte. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, uh, Joseph Casera, I was just thinking of him because he does queer mm -hmm. stuff. Um, man, Janine Capo, because she wrote Leaving High Ali, and it's also really beautiful. Um, I mean, everybody, Ingrid Rojas Contreras, who wrote The Fruit yeah. of the Drunken Tree, and she's wonderful. Uh, Love War Stories by Ivelisse Rodriguez. She's Puerto Rican. Oh, Jaquira Diaz also writes some. Um, somebody, somebody I really like is Cristina Rivera Garza. Mm -hmm. She brings a lot of gravitas to the uh, to to the Latinx mix. I think uh, Luis Rodriguez. Obviously, I, I like classics like Sheree mm -hmm. Moraga. He mentioned yeah. the reader mentioned Gloria Zaldúa. Sheree Moraga is actually putting a, together a great uh, series of, of Latinx writers um, coming up next month, beginning next month. Uh, UC Santa Barbara's um, Las Comadres project, I think. I'll, I'll try to find information posted in the in the link. But Marina Osa, um, there's a lot of talent out there in our community. We just you got to remember we're only one percent of all publishing in the United States, even though there's 60 million of us. So the fact that we have yeah. to struggle to find ourselves reflects the just sinister, awful dynamics yeah. of publishing. No, I, I thought she was uh, thinking from a more historical standpoint, but I see somebody mentioned Elizabeth Acevedo, which makes me also think of um, Angie Cruz and Jen de Leon and um, Stephanie Elizondo Grist and... Um, Christina Garcia, of course, Julia Alvarez. I mean, I think it's also a good idea. I would also suggest that if you like see, for instance, like Patricia's name, my name in a list. Um, I also, I always feel like they put us all in lists and there's always like really, also like really good other <laughs> books there. That's how I found out about a bunch of like people and stuff. And so, you know, like, I think that one of the wonderful things about the internet and social media is that you can connect with all of that really easy. There's a lot of um, people on Instagram that are doing a lot of, like, Latinx-specific things. And I'm thinking about Lupita Reed because uh, Patricia oh, yeah. also had an event with her. And she's mm -hmm. great, and she does a lot of, like, really, like, latinx focus, especially contemporary stuff. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's a ton of us um, who, are, who are writing. I want and to I also shout out. I believe that reading like Latin America, like Latin American writers, I think is also a really. I mean, I love doing both. It's it's different, um, but you know, like read stuff. If you read Spanish, read them in Spanish. If not, read them on translate in translation. Yeah. Um, it's also really great to just read stuff from like Latin America. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to shout out my dear friend Liz Huerta, who is, uh, I believe, watching us tonight, because she has a book coming out next year called The Lost Dreamer, which is uh, YA, and there is also a lot going on in YA literature um, reflecting our community as well. So don't limit yourself. And our esteemed host, uh, Josiah Lerete, has a book coming out April yes. 29th. Um, and you could probably find it on this back channel pretty soon, uh, if not sooner. That's true. Gracias. I'm going to be selling them out of the back of the alley at, at, at my car, El Camino. But uh, it'll be available at City Lights through the alley. <laughs> I think there's um, a little question up top. There's, a, there's, an, uh, there, there's a, an unanswerable question being asked by Steve, if you're all OK with this. Uh, I mean, yeah. you ask, how do you change the battle of stories from competing to conversation? I think that's a great question for Jean to start us off with because she is an expert on that, how the stories really can change the individual mm -hmm. for good or for more nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jean? I mean, my gut reaction was like, I don't know if we want that because that kind of like 
that feeling of like, let's be civil and let's always maintain like cordiality and respect for what the other person is saying, mm -hmm. even if they're spouting hatred is exactly what allowed a person like Stephen Miller to come into power. I mean, in college and high school, he always used the fact that there weren't a lot of um, people espousing his views to get uh, media coverage, to get space in the newspaper, to get time on the radio. Um, and it was a very effective argument. Um, and so I th and so I, I feel like he he didn't get called out enough. I think a lot of like from my reporting, a lot of people tried to have conversations with him in very civil ways. Like very rarely did he get called out um, in an angry or competitive way. Um, and that didn't seem to lead anywhere good. Um, so, but I don't know. I'm not trying to say that like we need to remain hostile towards <laughs> each other. <laughs> I just don't really know what the answer is other than like we need to filter news stories down from the top like right now the problem is this like we we still have like a largely white uh male dominated publishing industry entertainment industry uh media news media all of our culture making industries are dom dominated by white men and that forms the culture like they hold the reins of the culture and what we deem appropriate and our biases and so I feel like that's that's what needs to change. I and, totally um, love Jean's answer um, and I would just add that yeah I mean that is an impossible question but we are nothing if not creature of the, of the impossible right uh, as writers and as people that want to make a difference in the world so I have no I don't like war, I don't like war framing, but we're at a stage in history right now where you had Barack Obama kill thousands of Central American kids in the deserts of Mexico. Go look it up. It's on the Department of Homeland Security stats. If you look at the numbers of people killed in the deserts, women, children, men, there's the numbers of almost 3,000. Trump continued it. Biden will continue the militarization of the border that Gene writes about. You have the killing of folks. You have, uh, you know, perpetual warfare, and Latinx people's paying a, a very high price. But we are the most, proportionally speaking, given our sixty million numbers, we're the most unstoried group in the U.S., hands down. Okay, as far as the numbers to the number of stories, one percent of U.S. publishing. So I prefer to talk about a war of dreams. There's a war of dreams afoot. They're killing us literally in the, inside the borders and south of the borders. So Stephen Miller reflects a, you know, a, a, a genocidal instinct that has been at the heart of this country for, from its beginnings. So why hide away from that? Take off our, let's take off our lyrical gloves and throw down as powerfully as if our lives depended on it is more my approach. Although the question is impossible to answer. I, I just wanted to um, add something. I think those are both amazing answers. But Roberto, you're talking about us being like an unstoried community. And that's so true, because part of what Gina is saying also is the omission of stories, the lack of stories is also a huge contributor to this issue, uh, creating false realities, um, a false sense of who, pe who people are. Um, so much so that the large majority of people in this country are here because somebody in their family line immigrated, right? But there's such disassociation with that fact in order to, um, you know, look down on people who are doing that now, you know, uh, and so that they can do do so with with judgment and without compassion. So, and, and it's because people forget to tell their stories and people, and when you don't repeat the stories, you don't tell the stories, you don't bring those truths to the light constantly, they go away and they let people live in oblivion. One of the things I learned from war was that to kill somebody, you have to take away their story. You have to dehumanize them. Mm -hmm. Same thing with policies that cage children, right? Or separate parents from their mothers. You have to take away the humanity of Central American children so that Barack Obama can get away with what he did without paying a moral political price for it, whereas Donald Trump did. And the numbers, the statistics are, they, part in part, they match very closely as Gene will tell you. 
That's correct. I mean, the main difference was that with the Trump administration, we saw an escalation of the demonizing rhetoric. And so as a result of that, we saw a concurrent resurgence of white supremacy in the uh, mainstream population, which is dangerous in, in a separate way, uh, aside from the systematic violence, uh, the systematic state violence against immigrant communities. There's also the white terrorism, which is now one of the, it was the top homeland security threat to the country. Um, but just tying this back to Patricia's book, like this is, this is why these beautiful stories um, right. that humanize us. And I mean, I don't know, I hate, I hate, I actually hate using the word humanize now, <laughs> but, um, but that like convey the truth about immigrant communities are so important. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my story is just one story and it's such a typical story. It's the story of this family is so common. I did not have to look far to invent this. It's um, but as a writer, you know, I, I just try to write books that I that, that I that I feel like I are missing for me as a reader, which is why I get so excited about all of your work and all of your books, because you're writing this space you know, um, so that we can see ourselves. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it makes it makes everything more empowering and everything stronger. You can ask Julianne, you, Patricia, if there's, with you, you're doing really well, like literally, you're out there, they're, they're getting good props, and deservedly so. And is there a Colombian explosion here in the US of Colombian literature uh, in English? Fuck yeah, we're taking over. <laughs> <laughs> it's our time now. Go South America. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think for me, it has been, I think the beauty of um, the novel coming out, because it was my first novel, was connecting with so many Colombians in this country. Like, I did not know that there were so many of us here that were writing, um, mostly because, you know, I live, I, you know, when I lived in Miami, it was different. There's Colombians everywhere. But even then, like I didn't have literary friends. And then in, in California, there's not a lot of Colombians. And so it's been such a beautiful experience to connect with so many people here and to feel like such a bigger part of this diaspora for me. Like I love getting messages from, and I've, and I've done like a few class visits with Colombian professors and like people who just feel like really deeply and it just feels my soul and my heart so much. Um, I mean, when anybody reaches out, but it's like when I have these conversations with like Colombians here, it's, it's incredible. There's a lot of us. I mean, and like clearly, you know, we've been a war for like, you know, 50 years. And so there's been so much migration. But I think like, I don't know, I think there's also because we're trying to create a more nuanced understanding of what Latinx is, then there's more space for other people, right? Like, what about queerness? What about transness? What about like, drag queens what about the underground well we also party we also fuck we also do all of this like what about all that stuff what about just like our daily drama of like what to put on you know like that's important too like that's also a way that we are human and that's also a way i mean part of like my desire also to write was and to write this book specifically was also to just like see like immigrants doing just regular shit like just being like we're gonna eat and have drama between us you know and like of course like there's the pressure of all this systemic stuff on everybody. Um, but I also just wanted to have space for immigrants to just not be respectable, to just be messy and to just like, because like that also exists. And so I think that that's happening. And I also think that with the Black Lives Matter movement last year, there is this conversation that now has exploded and it benefits us, right? Like if we're centering black people then we all also get benefited from that. Um, and, and there's this question. And I think that people are wanting to have like more nuance, um, conversations around like us and that feels very exciting like I'm having all these conversations with you know with film producers and all the stuff around that here and like people just want something I mean they also can make money and not that capitalism is coming in and like they can make money out of our stories and so like we're going to be there um but I do believe that Colombians are coming in maybe just because like I've, I've done a bunch of stuff with other Colombians but I think we're also coming in because there's a desire to expand the notion of what Latin American means here, of what Latinx means. And so like all of are coming in to just like, you know, show a different shade of what being coming to this country means. Um, 
just because we come from a little bit more far away <laughs> and we come with a different geographical history. It's it's slightly different, but it makes a huge difference in like how we're how we're telling the story. What do you think, Patricia? Do you think we're taking over? Um, yes and no, because if you think about, I think there are more than 5 million Colombians living outside of Colombia. It's one of the largest diasporas in the world. So proportionally, <laughs> no, you know, there's room for a, a lot more voices, but I'm very excited because I like, you know, they're coming, you know, the, the, there's so many amazing, um, so much amazing talent, just, you know, breaking out and breaking through right now. So I'm really excited. Okay, we have time for one more question here. For Danny who's, uh, wanted Patricia uh, to answer this one. He says, uh, after four books on migration and diaspora, what are the questions that feel most alive and unresolved to you? Has this fourth book changed your self-consciousness in any ways? Um, thank you for that question. I really appreciate that. Um, what I can tell you is that I have aged parallel to the writing of my books. <laughs> so um, my first book, Vida, was published 11 years ago, you know, um, and I, it was written before that. So um, all my books obviously concern themselves with immigration diaspora because that's the world I live in and the body I occupy. And that's how I am experienced by the world. So that affects how I see the world. But I've also um, been much more interested in not only intergenerational stories, but specifically things that we carry in the body over generations. And epigenetics is a little side interest of mine. Um, so um, yeah, I become more interested in, in just uh, the idea of ancestry, but something, the scientific aspects of it, the, how we carry the, the land and um, those who came before us in our actual DNA. So I think that's something that I'll try to go deeper into for my next novel. I don't know if that answer the question. <laughs> I think it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, uh, mi gente, let's, uh, let's please give it up uh, for all our wonderful writers tonight, especially Patricia Engel, celebrating your new book, Infinite Country, yeah. Por favorcito, give it up for Jean Guerrero, Julie Delgado Lopero, and Roberto Lovato. So it has been a beautiful evening of conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we're and remember to buy the book. Buy the book. Yeah, there all the links are in the, in, buy in all, the comments. Buy all the books. All buy the a books. book, give it to a friend, buy another one, and, and you know, keep the cadena going like that for sure. And support City Lights. But Get these, your body to the store.